Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our webinar conference, How to Prevent the Abuse of Hawaii's Emergency Law. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and today is a very special day at the Institute. It's February 12th, 2021, and it marks the 20th anniversary of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. So give a great shout out for that. For the last 20 years, we've worked hard to defend individual liberty, economic freedom, and accountable government. And we'll have many events throughout the year starting today celebrating our 20th anniversary. So stay tuned for our emails and our special website that will list those events. Now, many of you watching today may know our founder, Dick Rowland, who unfortunately passed away in December of 2020. Uh, he was so committed to individual rights that his phone number included a tribute to the Declaration of Independence. His phone number in area code 808 was 864-1776. That's 864-1776. Well, today we're going to begin honoring him in another way and celebrating our 20th anniversary by kicking it off with the adoption of that phone number for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. So whenever you need to get a hold of your favorite independent institute on public policy research, call Grassroot at area code 808-864-1776. You see, Dick Rowland upheld the Declaration of Independence because it created and ensured individual freedoms of, for the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And today we're going to delve into those liberties which are being violated by an abuse of Hawaii's emergency power laws. On, in 2020, Governor Ige began to issue emergency proclamations that have so far in, that intended to protect the public health. But there are consequences of these proclamations that were not considered at the beginning. How do we ensure liberty is not in any way hindered by these lockdowns? We've got two people today who are scholars at the Grassroot Institute who help us to understand the legal implications of public policy. And I'd like to begin introducing them now. First, Robert Thomas. Robert's a scholar of the Grassroot Institute, and he's senior attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Hi, Robert. Thanks for joining us. Oh, and hi. Hello, Ali'i, Dr. Akina, and thank you for having me on. He just joined uh, full-time the Pacific Legal Foundation after having worked with him part-time, and he specializes in property and land use issues, appearing as counsel on behalf of landowners and others for filings before state appellate courts state Supreme Courts and the United States Supreme Court. Now, prior to joining Pacific Legal Foundation, Robert Thomas was in private legal practice for more than 30 years with Damon Key Leong Kupchak Castard here in Honolulu. Right now, he's in California broadcasting from near San Francisco. Um, he's also the inaugural Joseph T. Waldo Visiting Chair in Property Rights Law at William & Mary Law School in Williamsburg, Virginia, where he teaches upper division courses in eminent domain, property rights and property law. Again, we're so glad you're with us, Robert. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you for that kind introduction, Kili. I look forward to a very enlightening and uh, uh, informative discussion with you all. I'd also like to welcome on board Malia Hill, so you can turn your camera on, Malia. Good to see you today. M Malia is Director of Policy for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and she's got a background in law, politics, and communications. She completed her undergraduate studies in Mount St. Mary's University and obtained her JD from the Catholic University of America. Now, after working in Hawaii politics at the state level, including a brief period with Representative Mark Mo Moses, she went on to work for several advocacy groups based in DC where she currently resides. As policy director for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, she works on both national and state issues affecting the future of Hawaii. Now, Malia recently wrote the Institute's new policy brief, Lockdowns Versus Liberty, and I really want to encourage you to look that up and download it from grassrootinstitute.org. It outlines specific ways in which Hawaii's emergency powers to law can be reformed. Malia, thank you so much for joining us again today. Welcome back here to Hawaii. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be there, even if only virtually. <laughs> <laughs> well... You're an island girl in any case, and we hope maybe you can move back here permanently. Same to you, Robert. The Hawaii is, on, is your home as well. 
Now, I've got a very simple format today. I want to encourage those of you in the audience to ask as many questions as you possibly care to ask, and we'll try to let our panelists answer them. And that will take place in a few minutes after I've posed a couple of questions of my own for them. And we'll start off with Robert. Uh, Malia and Robert, I just want to remind you, it, it would be helpful if you could confine your responses to three minutes to these questions, and that'll help us move to the questions from the audience. Sound good? Here's my question for Robert. You know, you've been researching Hawaii's emergency powers laws for quite a while. Could you explain exactly what that means, emergency power law? How does it work? How has it shaped the way that the COVID pandemic has been handled here in Hawaii? Give us your insight yeah. into that, please. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Ian, I'll, I'll, I'll rely on you or Joe to cut me off if I get uh, any part over the three minutes. Uh, but that's a, you know, a, a very good way to start this because Hawaii's, when we talk about Hawaii's emergency management law, we're talking about a statute adopted by the state legislature uh, not that long ago. And so the, the prior to that, Hawaii's emergency management response was dictated by statutes and rules that were really scattered all over uh, the Hawaii revised statutes book, uh, books. And then uh, just a few years ago, the Hawaii legislature kind of got with the maybe the more, I'll describe it as the more modern trend. And they adopted a statute that consolidates essentially all of these uh, the questions about who has what power, what is an emergency and whatnot. And so uh, in that there's kind of three points I think everybody should keep in mind as you, you know, I advise everybody pick up the statute and read it. First of all, the statute defines emergency. What is this thing that we call an emergency? Is it, I know it when I see it? Well, not quite. It's more like uh, uh, it's extraordinarily broadly defined. Almost anything a governor or a mayor deems to be an emergency could be an emergency. Second, um, both in the planning for and especially in the reaction to a declared emergency, a governor, or in cases of counties, has extraordinarily muscular powers. I think there's no better example of that. Uh, than what uh, Hawaii has lived through in the past year uh, with essentially a series of executive edicts uh, coming out of uh, um, uh, Veritania Street um, or Washington Place, I should say, uh, dictating what uh, can be done and what can't be done. And then third, the other function or the other key provision that I would highlight everybody is like a lot of state similar state statutes that define emergencies and delegate from the normal uh, law and rulemaking functions of the legislature to the governor, uh, there's a time limitation, uh, 60 days under Hawaii law. So each of those things uh, are important. Definition of emergency and who defines it, uh, the type of powers that are delegated from the legislature to the governor, and then the time limitation. Thank you. Well, you know, that's very helpful to understand. And I think many of us are aware of the fact that last year we started with emergencies that, with a, an emergency proclamation that should have expired after 60 days, but we've had multiple instantiations of that or reinstantiations of that. And I'll ask Malia and you about that a little later on. Malia, let me ask you this now. In your report that you've published for the Grassroot Institute on Civil Liberties, and the COVID-19 lockdown. You say that reforming the emergency powers law is a better way to defend mm -hmm. civil liberties than by actually suing the state or federal government. A lot of people are going after suits. Why, why do you say that it's better to change the law than to go to court? Well, you know, there's two reasons for that. And, and one of them is just the nature of lawsuits um, in that, you know, it's a lot better to prevent the problem than to go seek redress. A lawsuit is only going to happen after you've already been injured. That's the definition of a lawsuit. And so our idea with this report was not um, trying to remedy the problem, but how can it be handled better? And the, the way to handle it better is to not have the problem in the first place. So to reform the law in ways that would kind of solve some of these problems before they start so that you're not waiting 
months or even years uh, in order to address a problem that comes up during this emergency period. The other reason is because of the way that courts tend to look at exercises of executive power during an emergency. You know, we can talk about, you know, how we think it should be, how we wish it should be, but we have to deal with the, when it comes to a lawsuit and the probability of success, you also have to just say, well, this is how it is right now. And how it is right now is that for the most part, courts give a lot of leeway, a lot of deference to the actions that a governor or a mayor, an executive takes under in an emergency. Um, they consider it, uh, you know, a situation where, you know, they've been given these powers. It's a limited time. The few cases we've seen uh, that make them even make it up to the Supreme Court tend to, they tend to accept when it has a really defined, you know, the right to worship kind of thing, a very strongly, clearly defined right, they tend to just kind of give the give the governor, give the mayor the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, that's not really what we're looking for when we're looking for how can we manage this emergency better? How can we create better guarantees of uh, civil liberties, of our rights, you know, beforehand? And so that's why I say it's better to reform the law now, because it's not about can we get a court to agree with us three years from now? It's, can we get these guarantees in place so that moving forward in the future, in the case of future emergencies, there's some protections already in place for our liberties, for our rights that um, will prevent these violations from occurring to begin with. Well, thank you very much. And you know, it's, it's not really much consolation to those who feel that we can sue our way to the, every solution. But I think that you're right that changing the law is the most practical and fe feasible long-term solution to the problem. Well, well, back to you, Robert. You know, a, a lot has been made of the 60-day expiration or time limit that was put on the emergency power laws here in Hawaii, but we're still under these emergency decrees. What, what's going on here? And, and, and can the governor really extend the emergency indefinitely? Well, there's two things, you know, or three things that are in tension here. Uh, first of all, the, the statute, when I say extraordinarily muscular powers and who gets to define an emergency, the statute itself is really bold in the sense that it said the governor, or in the case of a county emergency, a mayor, has the sole discretion to determine this is an emergency and this is what I need to do about it. And, and here's the key part, and it's written right into the law, the governor is the, quote, sole judge of the existence of the danger, threat, or circumstance, circumstance giving rise to a declaration of a state of emergency. Wow. You know, that uh, the sole judge. And so uh, judges, when faced with that, uh, will almost never uh, say that, that, that well, uh, sole judge means sole judge. You know, they're not going to overrule that and say, I don't think there's a danger here. Um, so it doesn't become a question of evidence that we as lawyers kind of look at. It becomes a question of who's got the power to exercise this. And in, in this statute, the legislature delegated it. That being said, the second thing in tension is uh, the facts, right? Uh, uh, we tend to think of emergencies, I think, in sort of the, you know, uh, a tsunamis on the way. A tsunami is hit, a uh, hurricane. Um, uh, you know, God forbid, uh, North Korean missiles are inbound, right? I mean, we, we tend not to think of emergencies as lasting a year, as they have in this case. And so that is in tension with that 60-day limitation uh, that I mentioned, that you mentioned, Billy, um, uh, that says it's supposed to be a hard stop, 60 days, maximum time for an emergency. But what happens when the situation continues, some governmental response is necessary or otherwise called for. And I don't think I, I mean, as a lawyer, I am hesitant to uh, state things in the extreme, but I think at the, the way it has been implemented uh, in this ongoing situation uh, by the governor's office, uh, the 60-day limitation, the express 60-day limitation in Hawaii's law as it currently stands is a virtual dead letter. It is completely ignored uh, by the governor. 
Uh, the legislature hasn't done anything, in, in my view, to curb uh, the governor's uh, exercise of those powers beyond 60 days, um, and nor have any courts. Uh, does that mean that the, the legislature, the government, the governor is incapable, you know, without power that, it, okay, if an emergency lasts 61 days, that's just, sorry, at 60, after 60 days, there's nothing you can do. Of course not. There are certain things that were supposed to be built into the law that required the governor to go back to the legislature and check, uh, or that we, the people, you know, ult the ultimate sovereigns in our system, uh, uh, they were supposed to come and ask us, what next? Uh, but we haven't seen any kind of response like that. We've simply seen a series of what the governor calls supplemental proclamations. And I've looked up and down the law for, is there such a thing as a supplemental uh, proclamation that sort of continues on? So, you know, uh, I think the first one was just two weeks or something like that. And here we are nearly a year out. Um, and so I, I don't think that it's being too or I'm overstating it when I say that 60 day limitation that's right there, plain as day in the statute, has been virtually ignored by the governor's office in this, in my opinion. Robert, you used the phrase, we the people, and by that, I assume you're saying there's an issue here in terms of maintaining the balance of powers between the, the different branches of government, particularly the legislature, which represents we the people, and the executive. Um, how serious is this? threat to the balance of powers with respect to the ongoing emergency proclamations. Yeah, well, I think Malia also alluded to that, but it was so serious to me that on my own time, um, when I was wearing my Damon Key hat prior to joining Pacific Legal Foundation, and by the way, these, if, you know, if you don't like what I'm saying here, these are my opinions are my opinions. They're not the opinions of my law firm, Pacific Legal Foundation. But I actually undertook a study of this on my own in my sort of law professor capacity uh, to see because it concerned me. Uh, you know, the greatest one of the, the, the brilliance, I should say, of our system, whether it's our the way that the Hawaii government is structured, whether it's the way the federal government is structured, is that internal tension that to diffuse power. We, the people, del I mean, ultimate sovereigns in our system, we delegate that power to uh, our government. And then within that government, we've set it up so that each checks the ambitions and power of the other. And there's really no better example of that system breaking down uh, than uh, what essentially we have. And I want to use this with us. Uh, be very careful about my words here because uh, I don't want to be accused of calling the governor a dictator with a capital D definitely not. I mean, we're still living in a democracy. But if you go back and check, you know, online, the definition of dictator and where that came from, originally, it was not sort of this pejorative word. It was simply a description of a Roman official who was appointed during times of crisis by the Senate for limited times to, to uh, consolidate all power and could rule by decree. And that's essentially what we have. But that the problem with that is even in the most severe emergencies, our system never throws out, never lets go of the idea that separation of powers, the diffusion of powers among the, between the people, the legislature, the courts, and the executive is supposed to be in tension. It's not the most efficient system, maybe. But it's one that in the course of doing that, if the government adheres to those limitations, you will see coming out of that a protection of individual rights and liberties, all the things that the people who are listening into this are concerned with. So it's not what you will see making headlines. You know, no headline writer is going to say separation of powers at jeopardy by emergency law. There's other things that grab headlines. But from my perspective, and I'm assuming kind of yours too, Malia, um, as a lawyer, to me, that's the number one problem with these, is you have um, uh, untrammeled almost power uh, being delegated by the statute to the governor, and then the governor exercising that untrammeled power, um, perhaps in good faith, I don't know, uh, but I, I kind of assume so, but that's ultimately not the point. The point is that in the, we, we tend to lose the danger of us losing our liberties uh, really jumps up when those limitations aren't honored by 
the government itself. Because as Malia pointed out, the courts aren't going to really police the boundaries between the branches very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I want to go to Malia now. And in light of Robert's comments on separation of powers and maintaining the appropriate balance, what are the implications of one of the first things that Governor Ige did in his first emergency proclamation, which was to suspend sunshine law and open meeting laws? I know you've talked a bit about that in the past, and you've had concerns about that. Yes, I mean, I think that, you know, as we've experienced it, we tend to focus on, you know, the big things that we see, the closure of businesses, the stay at home orders, you know, masks and such, and think that this is really about that when we talk about separation of powers. But um, from a more technical perspective, the real concern is that governor acting as kind of this super legislator. And he, if you go through, there are 18 separate emergency proclamations. And when you, if you are so inclined, you can go online on the governor's website and look at them. And you can find the stuff about stay at home. That's two paragraphs. What takes pages and pages and pages are all the suspensions of laws. Um, suspensions of laws regarding, you know, tell us some of them we like, some of them we don't, but the point is that they've gone on for months and months and months, this ability to suspend laws. And one of the very first things that was suspended was open records and sunshine law. And, you know, to anyone who believes in transparent accountable government, that, you know, that's not a, it's not a partisan thing. It's the kind of thing that just should make alarms go off. Um, we've said over and over in an emergency, we need more transparency, not less. But because of the really broad powers of the governor, he has the ability using the emergency management statute to suspend laws as he see fit. Um, you could ask, well, why would you need to suspend sunshine and transparency? And, you know, the argument would be, well, you know, we don't want people showing up at meetings. But you know, then you raise these questions. Does that really outweigh the need for the public to see the actions of government, especially in emergency? And then there's the whole, you know, responding to records. Oh, well, you know, it was an emergency and we didn't want people in the office. Well, that time has passed. Why can't you respond to records requests? Um, we know those of us who have worked with public records requests know that this is already a bit of a bone of contention uh, by people who who do do uh, open records requests from Hawaii agencies, any of which are not super responsive. And so giving a reason to not be super responsive was deeply concerning. And we, we question, um, number one, the exercise of power without transparency. Uh, and number two, the ability to make these decisions to shut down transparency and uh, sunshine laws just sort of with a stroke of a pen. Um, it's just a real example of the problem inherent in the broad powers that are there in the emergency management statute. Let's go back a little bit, Malia, uh, to your comment earlier that the important thing to do is to change the emergency powers law. And as you know, because you're involved with us almost every day in the grassroots office, we're monitoring carefully what's taking place at the state legislature right now. Uh, we're looking at the actions of legislators along these lines. Uh, can you just briefly, before we go to questions from the audience, indicate what, what we are advocating as specific changes to the emergency powers laws and whether there's some traction growing in, uh, with it in the legislature? Uh, of course. Um, in our report, the Lockdowns and Liberties report, we made some specific recommendations, uh, principles that should be involved in reforming Hawaii's emergency management statute. And first and foremost was the need for a legislative check on executive power. Uh, we kind of followed the example of other states and said that after a certain period of time, I would prefer 30 days. Um, you could argue it should stay with 60. The, in order to extend an emergency, the governor should have to get legislative approval. Um, and that furthermore, we think that the legislature should be able to end an emergency at any time by concurrent resolution. Uh, there are other principles that we'd like to see in there, um, like a uh, deference to uh, due process, um, especially when we're talking about removing a right or shutting down a business. Um, we want um, a 
a demonstrated respect for balance of powers. We would like to see more transparency um, and limitations on the ability to shut down transparency and open records. Um, so those are the those are the basic the basic principles. Oh, also, uh, we'd like to see uh, uh, something that basically indicates that restrictions, regulations, um, especially in the case of a health emergency as opposed to a more general emergency, should have to be narrowly tailored, demonstrating a clear connection between the restriction and the public health aim. Those are our basic principles of what we'd like to see in reforming the emergency statute. Now, um, well, I don't often get a chance to say really happy positive things but about the legislature, but I get to today. Um, there is a bill that is generally a good step in the right direction that's making its way through the House side right now. That's HB 103. Uh, they have, at this point, it's got a couple of amendments along the way. Um, it's gone through two committees and it basically, it does create the requirement for legislative approval to extend an emergency after 60 days. Um, it also clarifies that uh, powers granted for emergency purposes still have to respect the state constitution. Um, it puts in a necessity of showing rational basis for suspension of laws. Um, so those are all great. Uh, my only, I guess if I were to criticize it, I'd like to see a little more uh, rational basis, not just for suspension of laws, but for restriction. I would like to see uh, a, the ability to end an emergency by concurrent resolution, um, which isn't there. And it also has a provision where the governor has to seek legislative approval to extend an emergency, but if the legislature doesn't act, the emergency is automatically extended. I think that tends to defeat the purpose of uh, you know, getting the legislative approval, even if it was the situation where the legislature would just automatically approve it anyway, I think being on record, making that statement that has value um, and helps undermine the fact that this is a voice of the people situation. But still, HB 103 is the start of something good. It does follow several of the recommendations we've made. Very good. Well, that's good news. And uh, like you say, it's not always that we can praise what's going on at the legislature, but there's some good direction, good momentum in terms of establishing more accountability with regard to our emergency management statutes. Well, I want to thank the audience for being patient now and to open up the floor to anyone who'd like to ask questions. Simply submit your question online and uh, we'd like to ask our panelists uh, Robert and Malia, if you'd answer very quickly, uh, because we've got at least 10 people standing by wanting to ask you questions, and I'm sure many will also submit questions in the next few minutes. And so for now, I'm going to hand over the podium here to our Executive Vice President at the Grassroot Institute. Joe, would you moderate this time and uh, pose the questions that have been given you by our audience? Sure. Um, Okay, we have one from Stanley Osserman who asks, why couldn't the statute be changed so that after the initial time limit, it requires a simple majority of the legislature to extend uh, 60 more days and then a supermajority to extend a third time? I mean, I think it, we definitely want to see something like that. Um, you know, generally, people, um, this process that we've been pushing for and that a lot of states use is concurrent resolution. Um, but uh, the basic principle, like, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Why can't the statute be that way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, I don't think there's any kind of uh, inherent limitation on that or, or, or whatnot. So uh, could it? Sure. Should it? Yeah. You know, um, it's just whether, like a lot of things, you know, this is, if nothing else, sort of the, the extent and time extent of this ongoing situation has shown that, that politics never leaves any situation. And the longer it goes, sort of the more politics plays a part in this. Um, and so you, you have to factor in those things too. Could the legislature do that? Of course it could. Should it? Yeah, probably so. Will it? Much different question. There's a few questions like the one Jennifer Carmen asks. She says, how do we get the majority of people to stand up and defend their God-given rights and not de depend on a judge or governor when 
those positions were originally put in place to serve we the people. So there's a lot of questions about, you know, how do we stand up and change things? Um, any comment there? Well, I'll say that uh, HB 103 is uh, on its way to the House Finance Committee, and presumably if it passes there, we'll go over to the Senate. So you can track the legislation that, you know, touches directly on this. And that's when I, that's one of the th reasons we talk about, don't wait for, don't wait for the courts. You know, the one thing that you do have in your hands is political action. Go testify on the bills, you know, talk to your legislator, let them understand that you really care about it. Petition your government, peaceably assemble, do not storm the legislature, you know, um, right. do all the things that, that the, the, the Hawaii and U.S. Constitution recognize as the appropriate way to exercise your political rights, you know, um, I know don't question, sit silently by. Which uh, constitutional or civil rights are involved when, um, when mask mandates are issued? Good question. Uh, you want me? To, I'll, I'll start. I'll start us off on that, Malia, and or try to lay some foundation, as as we lawyers say. And you can, you can, you can come in and and uh, cross examine on that one. I mean, ultimately, right? I mean, under both the Hawaii Constitution and the U.S. Constitution, recognize our right to life, liberty, and property. Um, and it's it's some combination of all of those, right? I mean, the freedom, freedom. When, when you think of the word uh, liber freedom itself, is not in the in the uh, either constitution in a prominent way. Um, but the concept of liberty uh, says I don't have to do things uh, that I don't want to, at least at its very basic. And so, you know, infringements on those uh, is a place I would start looking. And that's where most of the, the legal challenges have come from, either on liberty restrictions, my ability to go out, my ability to, my right to not wear a mask, let's say. Of, of my property rights, right? My my uh, ability to, or my right to, to run a business that's not being harmful to somebody. So all of them uh, are are potentially at play, and of course, in some situations, and about the only situations that we have seen where courts have taken a more active hand in policing these boundaries, and I won't even say striking them down these orders, but maybe it's more of a court a question where the court said, ah, yeah, it's a little too far, is where it, it infringes on what uh, you might call um, maybe First Amendment rights as our shorthand for that, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of, of uh, behavior, uh, freedom of association, and especially on the religion, um, exercises of religion, uh, where, the co where uh, some states have said, you know, uh, certain gatherings are okay unless they're religious gatherings, in which case they can't, they can't, uh, so many size, they can't meet indoors. And those have been, been primarily the most successful challenge, legal challenges that have come up so far saying, well, there's really kind of no uh, rational reason for distinguishing between a gathering of shoppers at Walmart and a same size gathering of shoppers in, or not shoppers, of, of congregants indoor uh, worshiping. Mm -hmm. Malia, anything on mass? Yeah, um, it's it's interesting because uh, when we started working on the lockdowns and liberties, we talked about the fact that people have a real sense of loss, this feeling that their rights are being violated, but they're not rights that have a name, because we don't even think of them as things, you know, who would put a right to leave your house in the Constitution? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, who would leave the, the right to walk around with your face showing in the Constitution? That doesn't make any sense. And it's one of the things that people have sort of struggled with um, over the course of this, because, you know, that's not how courts work. Courts don't work on but there really should be. I mean, it's just so obvious. <laughs> um, and so, uh, it, that's again, I come back to that's why we talk about working through legislation because this is this is in the muddy area of the law where you know what you feel very strongly like this is outside of the realm of what you know anyone should be working in, and yet and yet it doesn't you know it doesn't feel good. Um, I can say that you know the few times the very few times we've seen a judge talk about things like a stay-at-home mandate. Um, it kind of worked around, um, like uh, Robert said, uh, First Amendment or a due process was the other one that came up. Um, 
where it was really just a question of, you know, did you demonstrate that this is, you know, narrowly tailored, that this makes sense? Um, that That's kind of the, the playground for it. Um, but political action is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, Sharon Wells asks about, uh, she says, there's doubt a serious, or excuse me, there is a serious doubt that an emergency exists right now. Um, and shouldn't we challenge the premise in a lawsuit such as Ohio and New Mexico are doing? Um, I'm not aware of those lawsuits. Do you know about those? Um, I'm not, I know there's a lot. Uh, I kind of try to keep an eye on them, but um, I can tell you that in, at this moment, there are just tons and tons of lawsuits and they expect that, you know, finishing the litigating COVID is going to take years. Um, the ones that have been successful in the civil liberties realm as of late have been about uh, freedom to worship, that kind of thing, that kind of First Amendment freedom. Um, those, that's that's where the where the successes have been, um, and it it will take years. That's one of the problems with you know why don't we just challenge? Well, you know the Hawaii courts aren't friendly to these kinds of things. Um, and it will be years before you have the remedy, assuming everything goes perfectly well. Do you think that um, as we move along through the year, uh, more people uh, get vaccinated, people start to feel safer, that um, there will be some kind of opportunity or um, movement for a lawsuit about whether or not an emergency really exists? I mean, uh, by the end of the year, what do you what do you view uh, the legal um, uh, challenges to be. You know, I'll, I'll again start on that one. And uh, I'll just, I can't, you can't say, right? I mean, uh, the one thing you can say is these type of lawsuits are extraordinarily difficult to win. And I go back to even in non-emergency times, courts tend to defer to the legislative branch when they do things. And to some degree, the, 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 the executive branch, when it implements laws. And I don't want to get too far down in the weeds, but if, if you know, you're challenging a, I don't know, let's just pick something out of the hat. Let's say rent control, you know, just not because of rent control, because of any pandemic or emergency, but just rent control because the legislature thinks rent control is a good idea. And you're a property owner and you sue um, in court. The court is going to probably give that type of legislation and the way it's implemented an extraordinary amount of deference and say, well, you know, whether, whether it's good economics or bad economics, that's really not for a court to decide when it's trying to determine whether this infringes on life, liberty, or property. Um, and, and so always keep that in mind that these type of cases, even in the best of times, non-emergency non times are extraordinarily difficult. And then you put in on top of that, the idea that I don't think any judge and this is just practicality, and this is not you know, wearing a lawyer hat. No judge is gonna wanna be splashed across the pages of Civil Beat or the, the Star Advertiser. Judge strikes down emergency law, you know, don't wear a judge solely, one judge solely responsible for saying y'all can go out tomorrow without masks or whatever it might be. Um, there's just a lot of uh, built-in institutional reluctance on the part of judges to what judges call second guessing the other elected branches, because at least in Hawaii, our judges are not elected. They're not directly accountable to us, the voters, in any way, except indirectly through the nomination and approval process. Um, and then when they come up for re, uh, uh, a reconfirmation, if they choose to do so. And so we look through it through those two lenses and, and, and two ways to look at it. First of all, go back to that provision in the statute that I quoted earlier. The governor or mayor, in the case of a county emergency, shall be the quote unquote sole judge of whether there's an emergency. So what does that tell you mm -hmm. uh, if you were a judge about whether you're going to say, well, you know, I know it says sole emergency, and but I'm going to say otherwise. And so the only thing that you could look to at that point is saying it violates that provision itself violates some part of the Hawaii or US constitution in that it delegates too much power, uh, as Malia said. In other words, you, you cross those lines and blend those boundaries between the legislature and executive 
and we start getting what looks like a Roman dictator. Um, well, I want to get to some yeah. uh, more questions here. So that's, had the, I'll wrap with that. Uh, sure. It's just very difficult. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. And the right situation has to prevent, present itself. Okay. Um, someone uh, emailed us last night, uh, founder and CEO of uh, For Our Rights, Lavana Loma. And she says, after reading Lockdowns versus Liberty, which is our report on our website, everyone, uh, that Malia did, uh, she says, well done, Malia. So after reading Lockdowns versus Liberty, she said, there's one critical component to the question of whether or not a lawsuit can be won in a constitutional challenge seeking injunctive relief, and that is the demand for strict scrutiny. So can you, Malia, talk a bit more about what is strict scrutiny standard and, um, and how do you define that? Um, okay, well, the, and by the way, thank you for the compliment. Um, so when a court considers a, a action, a governmental action and weighs, you know, whether it is okay, I'm, I'm going to just go simply, whether it's an, an unconstitutional infringement or whether it's permissible, they have varying levels of scrutiny, how hard they look at it. And it's basically a way of saying like, how, how good a reason do you have to give us for this law uh, or this action? And um, the highest form is strict scrutiny. And that's applied when, we, when a fundamental right is at stake. Um, fundamental rights being either rights that are specifically named in the constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, or rights that a court, generally the Supreme Court has said are a fundamental right that's a little muddier. Let's not get bogged down in that. <laughs> um, and so strict scrutiny is applied when a fundamental right is at stake. And that means you have to see a compelling government interest. Um, there has basically, the government has to have a really good reason and you have to show like, yeah, this, this restriction will accomplish that. Um, way, 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 way down <laughs> in the scrutiny meter, you have rational basis scrutiny. Um, in theory, it's supposed to be the government has to show that it has a rational basis. Like, hey, you know, this this is a good interest. We have an interest here, and it, this should this should get there. Um, problem being that courts kind of are a little bit all over the place on how firmly they do that. Some courts really do like, yes, you know, I, we want to see some good reason for what you're doing and like some demonstration that this will help. Some courts are just like, hey, give us any reason at all. <laughs> And that's fine. And I'm not even really going to check into whether or not this actually will accomplish what you said it would. So the problem is, you know, strict scrutiny is obviously what you want um, if you feel like your right has been infringed upon. But more often than not, uh, especially with things like the closure of businesses, you're going to get rational basis review. And um, who decides that? Well, generally the judge. <laughs> the judge looks right. at, I mean, you make the case that this is what rights being infringed. The judge says, oh, I agree with you. Or he says, no, 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 that's not what's I happening. I hate to cut you off here, but we do have some uh, more oh, questions. But basically you're saying there's a there's a certain uh, yes. standard for Yes, uh, and yes, strict scrutiny would be good, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that's what you're going to get. Uh, Michelle Melendez asks, how do we keep mandatory vaccines? So I'm not sure if that's a question, but she, maybe I'll ask it this way. Uh, are, how, how we um, protect against mandatory vaccines or mandatory something Mandatory like vaccines, is it going to happen? Is that the question? Right, basically? yeah, yeah. Oh. oh. And, and is there a, do you think that there will be lawsuits on mandatory vaccines? How about yes. that? Yes. That one I'll say yes to. <laughs> Do you want right, to weigh in? Anything there, Robert? Uh, you know, just be uh, um, just because uh, you know government agents can't come drag you out of your home, hold you on the ground, and stick a needle in your arm against your will, doesn't mean that the courts won't give them a a lot of leeway to indirectly uh, encourage quote unquote, encourage you uh, to obtain a voluntary vaccine. And there mm -hmm. has been a grand total of one Supreme Court case, US Supreme Court case on this from 1905 that has recently come back uh, in the public consciousness called Jacobson. You'll hear it all, all over the place. 
And in that case, the government of Massachusetts uh, slapped a $5 fine, you know, said, get, get a vaccine. But if you don't, it's a $5 fine. Now, $5, you know, these days, you know, that'll get, won't get you a big gulp. But, you know, it, it, yeah. uh, in 1905, even that it's not a huge amount of money. So you could, per, you, even then you could get your way out of it. And the court, the Supreme Court in that case said, because it, among other things, it was adopted by the legislature and there was a way out. Uh, that's not going to in, uh, fr- infringe on your liberty interest and in not having a needle stuck in your arm. Another question, uh, Linda Pala- Paleo says, on what legal basis is the government able to forbid landlords from evicting tenants for non-payment of rents? That's a takings, kind of a takings question. Do you want me to to start yeah, us yeah, off yeah, here, yeah. Taking Okay, well, I'm going to make a, a, a little plug here, or actually two plugs. Uh, first of all, um, in addition to the, the uh, study that I was doing of Hawaii's emergency management law, by the way, that will be published any day now by the University of Hawaii Law Review, um, go get your subscription and go read my article about how I think we can reform the statute. Okay, plug, plug number one. Uh, Plug number two in the William and Mary Bill of Rights Journal uh, soon will be coming out uh, with an article analyzing that very question. Um, Are are these things what we would call takings or violations of due process? Saying that uh, normally in normal circumstances, uh, a property owner has uh, a a constitutional right uh, to evict tenants for not paying uh, rent, right? We're not, we're not, uh, landlords generally are not in the public housing business. Um, and so the question becomes, is this uh, what they call, we call in the law, taking, requiring people or allowing people to stay in um, even if they're not paying rent? Uh, and the bottom line question is, have these type of edicts uh, essentially turned what is private housing into public housing, right? And who has to pay for that? And that's a very, very, like all things, I guess, a legal things, a difficult question so far, there has been a number of challenges to these type of uh, suspensions of eviction laws and other things around the country. They are making their way through the courts. Those that have been resolved, none of them have been resolved in favor of the property owner that I know of. Doesn't mean that they won't be successful. In Depending on the circumstances, they could be successful. But so far, as I can I tell, see. none of them have. It's going to take time. Um, yeah. Michelle uh, has a, a really good question. Can a county vote that there's no emergency, even if the governor still has an emergency? Short answer, not really. The governor's, uh, this is state law, the governor's opinion kind of prevails. Yep. I see. Yep. Uh, Jennifer asks, uh, Iowa and Maine, and Ohio got rid of their emergency mandates. uh, And so why can't we? Well, to some degree, it depends a lot on who who you elect, you know, actually to a incredibly high degree. It depends a lot on who you elect. Um, uh, Some places where we've seen challenges um, to the emergency uh, status uh, emergency period, usually there is a tension between the governor and the legislature, or there is, you know, there are, uh, the legislature has to approve the continuation. There is some kind of thing going, some kind of tension going on between the governor and the legislature that basically gives the people the ability to say, you know, loosen up the emergency s- situation. And that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. There's a few people here who uh, say that there is a petition with signatures asking for the governor uh, for a town hall meeting to review the um, COVID-19 emergency. And um, there's a petition there, tinyurl.com slash Hawaii petition. Uh, I don't know what that petition is, but um, anyways, a a few comments about that. Um, Marion says mask mandates violate the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution because it prevents you from being secure in your person uh, when you cannot get sufficient oxygen and prevent yourself from inhaling too much CO2. Um, I'm not sure what you folks think about that. Um, And well, there's uh, one more question about uh, whether there is template testimony in support of HB 103, which is that bill, Malia, that you mentioned is uh, pretty good. 
Uh, we don't have any template testimony. So if you'd like to testify on anything, you'll have to uh, come up with your own thoughts. But if you'd like to, uh, oh, Malia, do you have anything to share there? Oh, I, I could say this, um, you know, we tend to miss like build up testimony and feel like it needs to be really formal and this real official thing. You don't need to do that. Don't worry about having, you know, templates and so on and so forth. There's, it's very easy. The legislature lets you do it online and you can just write, you know, support, oppose, or just comments. I like this. I hate this. You know, here's what I think. And, you know, just they actually, legislators really actually value uh, more than template testimony. They value testimony that looks like it comes from a real constituent with, you know, a real, real opinion on it. Okay, well, there are uh, a lot of, a lot more questions. I have one. Um, do new emergency orders reset the clock on the 60 day limit? Not the way the governor has handled them by calling them supplemental. He simply can, as I, as there's no definition of supplemental uh, or even an allowance within the statute for doing so, but the governor has, uh, with the approval of the attorney general, done so. And so, uh, I don't know, when I think of supplemental, I mean, I, I tend to think of, you know, this plus, we're keeping on going as opposed to rebooting. Um, and uh, uh, there have been some other state courts that have looked at that type of action uh, as with, with, let's say, a kind of a cocked eye and say, hmm, don't think you can really do that. Um, that if the, leg if the statute says 60 days or 30 days and there's, it's dropped dead, um, what can you do? You can go back and reboot. Maybe that's the way to do it. But of course, in doing that, uh, the governor would have to justify why are we still in this thing? You know, what now is different than it was 60 days ago that requires us to keep going forward. And I think that's, you know, and this is maybe more my um, consumer judgment than really anything to do with legal judgment. But I think that there's been kind of this extraordinary failure to be transparent uh, that starts with, you know, cutting off uh, WEPA and uh, public, you know, chapter 92 and the Sunshine Law. I think, you know, my own thing is more transparency would, would result in people accepting this and understanding it better and not thinking, wait a minute, this is, you know, they're using this as a pretext to do other things um, and whatnot. That the more transparency we have, um, the more people will, I won't say compliant, but the more people will accept uh, these, these restrictions from a political standpoint. As Malia correctly points out, ultimately that's where these things get resolved. Right, with with we the people mm -hmm. petitioning, and government being responsive to those petitions. Well, uh, let me wrap it up here. Then I, there are uh, a lot of questions here. I'm sorry that we didn't uh, have time for, um, but if you'd like to email us those questions, perhaps we can answer them for you. And uh, I'll ask uh, Kaylee to come back online here. Um, one. Other question that we have is, do you think the emergency will end soon or do we have a long battle ahead, anyone? That's a $64,000 question, yeah. isn't it? I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I knew that, I'd be president at this yeah. point, you know, or, or governor, maybe. Think, think smaller, but yeah, if I knew that. Well, that question certainly shows the anxiety we all have and the eagerness we have to return to the full restoration of our rights as given to us in the Constitution. I want to thank Robert Thomas so much for joining us today and wish you the very best as your work cont continues with the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. Thanks for joining us from Northern California, Robert. All right. Yeah, I may be here, but you know where my heart is. It's in the 808. Absolutely. And thank you for serving as a grassroots scholar. Malia, thank you so much. Good to have you on board today and with us all the time, advising us on our legal issues. Continue to be our watchdog up there in Washington, D.C. You did a good job today in conveying the essence of your research report, uh, Lockdowns versus Liberty. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, always a pleasure. And thank you, Joe, for moderating those questions to our audience. Uh, we would be very glad to connect you with Robert or with Malia. If you care to follow through on your questions, just email us or contact us at our brand new anniversary phone number in honor of Dick Rowland, 20th anniversary of Hawaii, 
or the 20th anniversary of Hawaii's Grassroots Institute, 808. Uh, Joe, help me out here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, the 1776 part is the easy part to remember, but it's 808-864-1776. That's, that's right. 808-864-1776. That's right. Wishing you the best from the 20th anniversary kickoff of the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. Aloha.